thank, thank you all for being here uh, to discuss uh, Ride the Cyclone. This is Jacob Lawrence, who collaborated with Brooke uh, Maxwell on the book Music and Lyrics, and in the middle between them is Rachel Rockwell, who is the director and choreographer. Uh, so first, we're going to begin by uh, showing you a little bit about how uh, Ride the Cyclone actually begins. Tonight, I shall speak of six teenagers whose tales ended abruptly on a roller coaster in a small dying town in the middle of nowhere. The former St. Cassian Chamber Choir, who on Monday, September 14th, 2009, would board the Cyclone roller coaster at 8.17 p.m. At 8.18, this same roller coaster's front axle would break, causing it to derail at the apex of the loop-de-loop hurtling the children to their deaths. So first of all, w uh, this voice is actually part of the play. This is not just for works and process to set it up. So could you tell me what is this voice and what is the story that we're going to be getting into? Um, uh, the voice is uh, Karnak, who's a uh, fortune telling machine. Who, um, who is basically effectively the narrator of the piece. He kind of glues the, all of the different elements together. And he's penitent because um, he read all of the children's fortune on the, on, on the cyclone, um, but he was set on family fun novelty mode, so was incapable of telling <laughs> them anything but an empty kind of platitude fortune. And so the whole actual performance is him trying to apologize, like, or try to, in kind of this purgatory state, to, um, show their hopes and dreams and loves right before he's killed by a giant rat named Virgil. <laughs> but now, was that a spoiler? I mean, or... or no, we, no, he comes out right, out right out the gate and tells That's you the that. That's so, yeah. yeah, so no spoilers there. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the voice of Karnak is actually your voice? Yeah, uh, in the Canadian productions, I did it, so I really tried to drum up my mouse, like, as much gravitas as my voice could possibly do. Uh, but in this, this version, it's Carl Hamilton, great actor from Chicago who plays um, Karnak, and he actually plays him on stage. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have a penitent robot. Uh, penitent robot. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting... Like we wish that Donald Trump robot that's floating around New York would <laughs> yeah, be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say that we are learning that Ride the Cyclone is not about the presidential election. So. <laughs> um, but... Why don't you tell me a little bit, Jacob and Brooke, about how you began your collaboration and how this came about, because I was surprised to learn backstage that your background is not in musical theater, and yet here we are talking about uh, a musical theater piece. Yeah, no, I, um, I come more from the like playwright background, so I'd written quite a few plays. Um, and then with um, my, my frequent collaborator, Britt Small, we started a cabaret theater company in Victoria, BC, called Atomic Vaudeville which was experimenting a lot with uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, like definitely came, Ride the Cyclone came out of that ethos, kind of this very uh, kind of little rascals aesthetic and we'd, we'd kind of put on a show every month and it was combining a multi kind of, you know, you'd have puppeteers, modern dancers, um, poets, um, you know, and kind of just straight up sketch and then Brooke, uh, you know, started to see the show, right Brooke? Yeah, I was a, I'm a musician uh, by trade, and I was a fan of theater and came across Atomic Vaudeville in a Fringe Festival and became a fan just watching and eventually grew, had enough courage to submit some audio. I wrote a little theme for them, which they never used or never wrote, <laughs> wrote me back about at all, actually. But uh, despite that, Jacob and I uh, started to work together, and I ended up writing uh, probably about 30, do you think we did about 30, 20 or 30, 25, 30 musical sketches for the uh, cabaret mm -hmm. and then eventually Jacob s said hey let's write a musical and not knowing any better and we thought it was gonna be really easy and it's yeah <laughs> well, well where did the idea come from is there a, is there a particular importance to September 14th 2009 I mean is there uh, well, not in your own life but per not in particular I mean it definitely came out of my own kind of um, personal loss uh, in trying to actually describe a mass tragedy or, or something that happens that, that you can't really, um, there's no rhyme or reason to mm -hmm. it. 
And so it was trying to kind of tell that, you know, and even Aristotle says that those are impossible stories to tell because uh, they're just spectacle and they don't mean anything. And so out of actually kind of a desperation, I kind of wanted to say, well, well what about telling a story about a mass tragedy? And that's really what the impulse was. And then, um, and also we, uh, th then I'd kind of, we'd kind of riffed around on how to tell that story and, and you know, and started off as, uh, it took place in Plum, Plum Coulee, small town that gets uh, a flood and then I, then I realized we couldn't afford to hire like a hundred actors. <laughs> uh, so then we were just riffing around and I finally got into cyclone, cyclone roller coaster and then kind of the, the, we set on a roller coaster thing and, and so th there was tons of styles of music in this and, and the thing I love about Brooke is he's uh, like he's mostly a jazz guy, but he's so liquid with so many different genres of music, and we really wanted, like it's not a mistake that every song sounds differently. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, was that designed to reflect that each of the six characters is an individual? I mean, one of the touching things that that uh, is said at early in the show is that in in a mass tragedy, uh, in many cases, the individuals lose their identity to just become the six people who were killed in this, I mean, and, and so is the, is the musical variety meant to recover some of that individuality? Totally, yeah, like because sometimes we do eulogize, because it's so hard to wrap your mind around just suddenly 10,000 people are gone. Right. And so, but also uh, using the kind of the aesthetic of the fairground, um, uh, if you ever go to a county fair, there's like, there's so many genres of music playing all at once. Like there's metal, there's um, 50s music, there's calliope music, there's just everything. Yeah. So we also wanted to capture that kind of feeling because we really wanted to build it to feel like a roller coaster, the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it also to reflect the music that we love. Like we're definitely coming from a place of music lovers. I do remember Jacob made it, made a CD for me early on, just to listen to to get some of the sounds of what he was excited about, and then I brought my own interests, obviously as well. You mean another the, the kind of music that you wanted to, to use to create yeah, the character that, totally that, that spoke, spoke to us and made us yeah. feel things and that sort of stuff. And obviously, I mean, for for me, I've I've grown up. I, I was jazz trained, but the the Beatles were the music that really really spoke to me. Um, and then as I I think we both share the aesthetic of the sort of Tom Waits carnival world and that sort of um, Americana sound as well. So uh, the music that's in there is music that we, uh, we love it. Like we, we really came from a, uh, that's music that we like to hear and like to play. Well, Rachel, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry we've had them talking past you. Um, okay. um, how, how did you discover this, this play? I mean, given that it was first done in Canada and you're a Chicago director. I was working with um, producer Kevin McCollum on another project and he said, there's this really great new show in Canada. Can you go to Vancouver tomorrow and look at it? And I said, no. And he said, well, go to Edmonton. And I went to Edmonton, Alberta to see the show. He said, there's been a new linear narrative that's been added to something that used to be a series of cabaret vignettes. And I went and saw it and, and didn't really know why I was there, but was immediately <laughs> taken with this really unique piece that, that didn't feel like anything that I had ever seen or heard before. And then um, a few weeks later, I found out that I would get the great opportunity to direct this piece and collaborate with Brooke and Jacob. And we've been working on it now for what, th almost three years? Yeah. About three years. Three yeah. years, wow. So when the production in Victoria and then in Edmonton was when then? Mm, yeah, we toured around Canada quite a bit. Um, 2012? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I toured around Canada quite a bit, and then um, the producer came on board, him and Morris Bouchard from Hot Feet, and they really loved the, the core of it, and it already had kind of a cult vibe to it, mm -hmm. uh, but they just said it, they really wanted us to put a story in, and, and then Rachel came on board, and so we spent about three years trying to put a story in right at the cyclone. And, and Kevin said, go find a home for this piece. So I went to um, Chicago Shakespeare Theater and said, I really, who has a great history of developing new work, and said, I really think that this piece, while it is very far away from the Shakespeare that you produce on your main <laughs> stage, is really going to be um, interesting and appealing to a whole new audience for you. And it was, um, it was a huge hit and was sold out, and there were lawn chairs waiting outside the box office for it in Chicago. And so, Jacob and Brooke, were you surprised, I mean, that uh, at the way this got picked up in Canada, I mean, that it had a life then beyond this cabaret, and then that you were coming to the United States? Did it all seem 
Sur yeah. surreal to you? The whole process has been <laughs> surreal for us, to be yeah. honest, like right, right from day one, because mm -hmm. uh, even in Canada, it's very rare for them to, for, for our, our country, like we've, it's a sadness in our country that we rarely put, there's rarely second productions of things. So we got the opportunity to kind of do, uh, do almost like, a, like about nine or 10 cities. So that was, it was always like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Because we started this off as just this fun project. And then when Rachel came on board, it was, yeah, it's, it's just been really totally, uh, like very, it's made me feel verklempt quite a few times about how, <laughs> how well it's doing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you came on board, Rachel, I mean, were they willing to look for this story? I mean, or did, did they oh, have yeah. to be persuaded that you knew what you were doing? No, I mean, uh, amazingly, even at, with something that has existed uh, um, as long as it had, there's always been a willingness with this team, I think, to explore it and to deepen the narrative and to reach for more truth and, you know, find stronger points of view for each of the characters. And, and you know, it's, there's always a wealth of material. It's mostly, <laughs> it's mostly editing. Really? Well, that's a perfect segue to what we have here. We have some pictures of uh, some of the first performances of Ride in the Cyclone that took place in Victoria, Canada. And so these are three, that's mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. And then this third one, um, I think everyone will recognize Karl Marx um, there presiding. And I'm told that, that Karl Marx has been edited out of the piece. He I didn't mean, make and, it. He uh, got cut. No, I didn't but, and, cut. and I wondered if it was too too dangerous to bring across the border. Um. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, no, I, I think the thing was because Ocean now that uh, that character right there, uh, uh, she like when we did add the storyline or the through line became for all intents and purposes the closest thing we have to a protagonist with the largest arc in the show. Uh -huh. And so Rachel told us her story should really her song should really set up. Uh, the story and so then we went away and kind of we came up with this whole bit with Karl Marx having a pillow fight with T Taylor Swift and, <laughs> and uh, Wait, and that's not in the yeah, show yeah, anymore? Yeah, she went, she went, no, I wanted it to be the most straight ahead number guys, right? You know, and so <laughs> Karl Marx just slowly, he, he'd been in so many of the productions. Th in this one, he's, uh, yeah, he, uh, the, but eventually we just had to lose him. But a little Taylor Swift remains, a yeah, little. Well, definitely uh, yes, not not yeah, in Taylor style Swift. only. Well, and I think just to recollect, I think this, this <laughs> picture up here, what the, the song was, we thought it would be funny if Karl Marx was singing a gospel tune. We were just sort <laughs> of excited about the idea of that, mm -hmm. and uh, the character at the time had this sort of split focus of uh, a mother who was teaching her one set of values and a father was teaching the other set of values. So we just thought it was just like a perfect uh, so was connection. Was it a gospel and song about the opiate of the masses? I mean, is that? Uh, <laughs> what was it? No, he was actually, because his mother, uh, her mother was an oil lobbyist in Canada. And so she, and she, she was teaching her how to be like this Machiavellian crude debater. Um, very Trumpian, actually. Like, yeah. <laughs> <And> so. Um, <laughs> And then Karl Marx, he's like, as a spiritual figure comes down and he's her spirit guide in order to tell her not to be a horrible person. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so we, that's where we started. And then when we were working with Rachel, we wanted to, we, we, that, that got big laughs in Canada. That was pretty, it was a very <laughs> successful part of the show, but we realized we needed to change the character to fill the story arc. So we were it trying to salvage, it was really funny. trying to salvage the Karl Marx. And then we said, what if we put Taylor Swift as the other spirit guide for our, our, our lead character? Yeah. I, I love that the character named Ocean, that her mother is an oil lobbyist. Mm -hmm. um, it Ocean like O'Connell <laughs> Rosenberg, you see the conflict. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, now we're actually going to hear a show, a song from the show that is in the show from the beginning and still in uh, the, the show. So Rachel, can you tell us what's going to, what we're going to be seeing? Can you set it up for us? Yes, well this is one of the very first songs that was written for Ride the Cyclone and it is a dream number performed by Noel Gruber who is a young aspiring novelist who in life had a humiliating job at a Taco Bell in a mega mall food court. He, however, was obsessed with the brooding works of nihilism and the films of Marlena Dietrich. <laughs> and in this French cabaret drag number, he marries these two obsessions in a song called Noel's Lament. Fine. In my life, I was Noel Gruber who worked at Taco Bell in Uranium City, Saskatchewan. But in my heart, I played a different role. I was Monique Chabot in post-war France. A hawker with a heart a 
of black charcoal. I write poems to burn by firelight. I drink champagne and guzzle gin. The good girls call me the town bicycle. Don't knock it till you tried my life a sin. Oh, Claude, my pimp nose never mess with me. Last prick did that faded quick to black. I have no idea where to find officers. But if you do, please mention that I'd like to have returned the pretty knife that I stuck ten times in his back. For I sing songs until the break of dawn. I embrace a new man every night. My life's one never-ending carnival. A world of bluesy, floozy, flashing light. I want to be that fucked up girl. He said, I think I am in love with you. I've heard that lie a million times before. Oh, tonight I give in to the fantasy. Take love when you can, when you're a whore. Surprise, I end up with his bloody kid. She cries and cries and cries, it leaves me numb. The gypsies offer me a pretty price. No doubt now she's poor, just like her mom. Mama. <laughs> For I sing songs until the break of dawn. I embrace a new man every night. My life's one never-ending carnival. A world of bluesy, bluesy, flashing light. I want to be that fucked up girl. So now I sell my love for opium in some rat infested Chinese dive. At night I burn myself with cigarettes just to somehow prove I'm still alive. Eight months later, I catch typhoid flu. Kicked out, I see the ugly light of day. Dying in an alley, a priest kneels down to My child, do you have any final words to the Lord you'd like to say? We tell him that like him, I choose to burn out rather than fade away. Mon Dieu! For I sing songs until the break of dawn. I embrace a new man every night. My life's one never-ending carnival. A world of boozy, floozy, flashing light. For I sing songs until the break of dawn. I embrace a new man every night. My life's one never-ending carnival. A world of boozy, floozy, flashing light. If I want to be that fucked up girl, I want to be that fucked up girl. If I had just one dream.
Brooke is, while Brooke is, well, about to get seated, uh, Jacob, if you could tell us, sort of, I, I know that you and Brooke um, collaborate on the music, or work on the music together too. Tell us a little bit about what was in your mind when you were writing this song and, and what, <laughs> what uh, I mean, if you can say. Uh, uh, it was, uh, um, it's actually based on a friend of mine who uh, uh, passed, passed away uh, early in his life and also a combination of, because I do a lot of cabaret theater and actually that is my, uh, that's my uh, drag character right there. So yeah, oh. so, yeah so it's kind of a, who always just always depressed, right? Everything is depressing. So um, and so kind of yeah, fusion of those things. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that actually speaks to a line um, also in, in the in the play uh, about I think it's Karnak who says, "Do you want to see the future that might have been?" Mm -hmm. I mean, so in a certain way, that number. Mm -hmm. is really the future that might have been for that friend of yours who passed away. Oh, totally. Well, or just that kind of, I mean, we also wanted to play with the idea of having a catharsis and kind of, and as opposed to it being kind of, like certainly with him, he wanted to suffer. He wanted to be a, a novelist. He wanted to be Jean-Paul Sartre. He wanted to uh, like smoke filterless cigarettes, right? But, but he ended up working at Taco Bell. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of his huge cathartic, uh, number in the piece in terms of just that he gets to realize because he also creates this whole po poem for himself because he's a novelist and yeah and so at that so th we tried to craft that the numbers themselves felt like a catharsis for right. the for the characters right? and were you trying were you thinking of the sound of that I mean from you know falling in love again I mean from the Blue Angel oh, or, totally, or yeah. Kurt Vile yeah or? totally I mean Brooke and I both love that music like the French mm -hmm. cabaret music so it was in, so we just really wanted to try to honor that kind of brook. Yeah. yeah. Everything you said. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it, it also reminded me of the number, the shady lady from Seville from Victor Victoria. Yeah, I totally, mean, so, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So Rachel, this is a number that's been in it from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and uh, what was different about this number in particular in Chicago from what you had seen in Canada? And then if you can look a little ahead, what, what was what we saw, was what we saw more like what it was in Chicago or what maybe it will be like at MCC? No, it, it's very similar. I mm -hmm. mean, it's been, he, uh, Colby Wardell has played this character. He, he's the only actor who has ever played this character. So he's been carefully crafting this okay. for years. And it, you know, it's, you, you don't want to get in the way of a masterpiece. <laughs> you just want to enhance what's there. But there are a lot of um, uh, elements in, in the production, um, film elements in particular, where we put him on the streets of Paris in a in his own f kind of um, you know French New Wave cinema fantasy. So there are <laughs> there are lots of really interesting technical elements um, to back it up. And Elliot uh, Elliot uh, who played um, Ricky Potts originally played uh, the piano the for piano, this. Yeah. Played the piano and for this and. Accordion. Yes, and now Alex in our company is, has recently learned to play the accordion for this oh, amazing, was, yeah, yeah. And so tell me then, I mean, when you're working as a director with a performer who's done something like this, as you say, it's a masterpiece, he's done it, he's the only actor who's played it, what is your role and then how do you look at what he's doing differently from maybe the other people who are also performing in the, in the play? Well, I mean, he's grown and the character's grown, so it's always a matter of being completely present in the moment mm -hmm. with that character. And that, I think, is always, is, is, the, is our challenge as we move forward, is, you know, always keeping it honest and being able to stay present and, and you know, balancing it out in, in the company that he's in. And these are, this is a new company of people, so, you know, definitely the relationships are different. Um, and I think that informs who, he, he, his character is at a spiritual soul level too. And is that, oh. Oh yeah, and I think that be, the beauty of, uh, you know, or something certainly Brooke and I and kind of us is, is that everybody is involved in each other's mm -hmm. numbers. So as opposed to them just splitting, like they're all the backup dancers or backup singers or anything such as that, which really I think reinforces uh, what we were trying to explore with the, with the actual piece itself. It's, it's, it's a true ensemble piece. Yeah, it. everyone mm -hmm. facilitates mm -hmm. the other person's it's fantasy and, yeah. the, and, and enables them in their fulfillment of mm -hmm. their wish. And then what's, what is your task, wh or what's the challenge, what's the opportunity for you as a director when you're dealing with uh, 
performers who are at different stages of their involvement with the play? Well, uh, getting everybody in the same piece is definitely the goal, you know, um, and, and forming, for us, it's always forming a true ensemble because this is in ev every sense of the word an ensemble piece. So it is, um, you know, laying the groundwork for uh, the relationships that we have in the rehearsal room to, you know, carry us through these very complicated relationships that we have in high school before you you have decided what which of yourselves is going to be your best self. You know, when you're in search of of things and all of the mistakes that you make. If we all think back on our own high school experience, I, I know <laughs> I certainly would like to go back and go, I'm sorry, I wasn't really, I wasn't fully who I am now, and you know, I was insensitive or I was. You know, so but we get to see we get to see them at their worst, and so it's you know for me it's it's setting a rehearsal room where people are willing to be extraordinarily brave to dig deep into those kind of vulnerable, ugly, um, interesting parts of themselves. And do you find Brooke and Jacob? I mean that that working with different performers has in, interested you in changing the music or oh, some of the numbers? Yeah, always. Like the dialogue is ever shifting because it is it is also when you do have a six person ensemble, it's it's the chemistry between all of them, and it right. always changes every time you change one little uh, detail to it. You go, oh, that is totally bringing it's shifted, it's yeah. some mm -hmm. different energy into the room. Yeah. So, so you haven't ever, it, with, with the six people, wanted to kill them all? I mean, as the cyclone <laughs> may or may not <laughs> There's do. There's days. Uh, you know. <laughs> no, we've but, been, uh, we've been yeah. pretty lucky. Sorry. It's been pretty <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're going to have um, another number soon. So what I'd, I'd like to do is, can you set up uh, the next number that, that we're going to see a little bit? Yes, this one has gone through a, a, a couple permutations and it tells the story of the one unidentified body of the cyclone roller coaster accident. She was decapitated and no one came to claim her body. So there's a tremendous amount of sadness that surrounds this character and also a tremendous amount of confusion for the character in the play because she doesn't know who she is, how she got there, or what she's doing. And in the production, she's personified um, by a, as a porcelain doll. So in, in the production, she, she has a, almost a porcelain doll's head with eyes that are completely obscured by black contact lenses. So she's a really um, kind of fascinating, beautiful, and terrifying character all at the same time. And it's like the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier or people who are never identified in mass tragedies. It's a song about a person whose very identity is obliterated called The Ballad of Jane Doe.
like an old forgotten tune, a song that no one knows. Forgot how it goes, just John and me forever eternally, Jane Doe. And I'm asking why. obviously has also a very different sound from, from the other. Uh, and if you could talk a little bit, I mean, among the three of you, I mean, about the ways in which different genres of music, I mean, not, this, this is not what, it's almost operatic, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, how those came together for you in Canada and then now in presenting it in the United States, in Chicago first, what, what were the different theatrical requirements and then what were the different theatrical responses? I mean, to, from the audience and critics. Well, I, I initially the idea was to depict um, somebody who was obliterated by it. Um, and again, certainly what we hear about, like just where they just no, were completely forgotten mm -hmm. or when you cross the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, that was just kind of something I found so uh, moving and hard to dramatize, of course, naturally. Um, and. And I think Brooke and I right away thought it should be have more of a uh, class like the soaring soprano right. that uh, and a howl. So that was that was always uh, how we interpreted the character, and the doll was, you know, and the doll and the makeup and everything that kind of came through there. How about, yeah, Brooke. Yeah. And and is that doll the same doll? I mean, is there a link somehow with the doll? From the song "The Fucked Up Girl," who is all, yeah. he's, he's oh, also yeah, yeah, yeah. They use the, they use that prop throughout the show, so okay. it's like yeah, it's, it's, it all takes place in a kind of one place, one time. Uh, so it's all taking place in real time. So they are picking up things that are uh, falling on the stage. Mm -hmm. So and just just to clarify, so the the setting is of a fortune telling machine that's brought the f the kids back to life, and they're they're not all freaky zombie kids. Uh, they're just like nor <laughs> normal looking kids, except the Jane Doe character who presents herself with black blackout eyes, contact lenses, so all the kids in this other world are also freaked out of the Jane Doe character as well. Well, they don't know who she is. They, they don't, don't know, they don't know how she she's is. connected yeah. to them, and no one, no one has any information about who, who she is or why she's there, which I think lends, it's, it, it's filled with pathos and, and, you know, that horrible feeling of, of not knowing and not belonging and not being important to anyone or anything. And well, also beautiful, uh, 
comedic ju juxtaposition of the sort of the kids who are freaked out, but also feeling a sense of this poor being who's walking around with their dolly offering, can I say the line? Yeah, sure. She says, would you like to brush my dolly's hair? But <laughs> the doll doesn't stop. have a head. Uh, anyways, so, it, so it's that the kids are kind of freaked out, but also in, uh, feeling the compassion with her as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's very touching to think, uh, and I mean, upsetting to think of uh, a, the group of people who would have been on this roller coaster and the randomness. I mean, if you, when you get on a ride like this, I mean, the, the people around you, you may be with you know, a few friends, but then dozens of other people you don't know, but then you're, when there's a, a crash or an accident, then you're all united, even though yeah. you didn't know one another beforehand. Yeah, uni unified in, a, in kind of, and I think that that's one of the themes which we're trying to explore in it is, they are unified in this horrible tragedy, but also for us not to remember um, people we lose through only that event, mm -hmm. you know, that, that that is only an aspect of their, their personalities. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one thing I meant with my question about the different reactions in, in Canada or in the United States. Um, because this is an accident. I mean, there may be someone asleep at the switch, but you know that's not what we're hearing about. I mean, I'm just thinking of all the mass shootings that have happened in the United States for mm -hmm. so. So the political uh, aim or the political, uh, uh, you know, sort of the penumbra of the political that mm -hmm. is that different in Canada uh, from what it would be in in the United States when people are thinking of mass accidents, I mean, it's more mass shootings that have yeah. been in the news so much now. Well, and that's certainly, some, even from my own experience of coming from a family of gun violence, that's um, certainly in our ether, but I feel, felt like we wanted it to be respectful of it, mm -hmm. but at the same time be really funny, right? You know, in terms of, so, <laughs> but, but to be funny in the, in, in the most respectful way possible, but right. like how any human being has is, is, is got a sense of humor as opposed to it being, something, so something cathartic, but we, that's why we intentionally made it allegorical, mm -hmm, yeah. not specific to something, because that's, that I would find that disrespectful on it, to a certain yeah, extent, unless yeah. you've totally had 100% right. permission, but I felt like this is, we were trying to uh, intentionally make it more of an allegorical setting. So, but I, I certainly see in the States, yeah, with the mass shootings, but, but this one is more specifically around how, how a lot of us go through life. We, sometimes we lose people because of a blood clot or, you know what I mean, and we have a hard time wrapping our heads around that. And so that's, that, that's, that was my sincere desire or my impulse to write the piece. And I think a lot of the comedy comes from the fact that these six people would never choose to be in purgatory together. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. you, no. take, you take the most disparate types from any high school and put them and say, you're going to spend your <laughs> eternity together, and they have some serious issues to work out. And that's where I think a lot of the tension and the humor comes from, you know, as they all strive to, you know, self-actualize. Yeah. yeah, and have that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, we'll continue the conversation after we see the next number, which is uh, called Sugar Cloud. So, Rachel, would you tell us a little I will. bit? It sounds very allegorical all, uh, <laughs> all, already. Well, Sugar Clouds um, used to have a section in it where a giant teddy bear began to surf with the main character, a la Elvis Beach Party style, and then played the drums for the rest of the number until one of the authors woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and said to himself, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> now it tells the story of Constance Blackwood, known to her classmates as the nicest girl in town. Um, we're going to do an excerpt of her monologue from the end of the play, and uh, which was the first thing that was ever written for Ride the Cyclone and her song, Sugar Clouds. I lost my virginity to a carny in a porta potty before I died. Like three hours before. It was kind of porno. He was like ancient, like 32 and he had a tattoo on his forearm. It was of two skeletons having sex, and it said, born to bone on the bottom of it. Isn't my tattoo the stupidest thing you've ever seen? <laughs> I fake laughed when he said that, because you should always laugh at guys' jokes, or they'll think you're a cow. My mom and dad own the Blackwood Cafe in town. It's been in my family since, like, forever. The Blackwoods have been in uranium since they opened the mines. My family had pride when it came to that. Till I went to high school. 
and having pride about our town was only like the lamest thing you could think to believe. After a while, I started feeling kind of crummy about stuff, like ashamed. At the cafe, I would catch myself looking at my mom and thinking, what a loser. A stupid, dead-end loser in a stupid, dead-end town. My parents were good people. And all I could do was think these horrible things about them. I really wish I'd never thought those things. I got so angry that I was born in the only family in uranium that raised their kids to think it was okay to do your working, living, and dying there. And I just got all kinds of poison after that. Anyway, my virginity. I just wanted to get it out of the way. I just wanted to do it so that I didn't have to think about doing it anymore. No. I just wanted to lose it in the most horrible possible way. Constance the lifer lost it to a carny in a crap box in a crappy town. Why, of course she did. And then I rode the cyclone with the other kids in the choir. And that's when the accident happened. We were at the top of the loop when the roller coaster made this kind of screaming metal sound. Sparks were shooting all over the place and then the screaming and the sparks just stopped. And there was this like weightlessness. My heart jumped a gazillion beats a second, but I didn't scream like the other kids, no. I was just soaking it all in. Because on a certain level, it was so rad. Sailing through the air upside down, you could see all the other rides, and it was like something unlocked in me. My heart welled up with all this love for everything. Images and feeling flooded into me like like getting back into my bed in the morning and feeling the heat left over from my body. Hanging upside down from the monkey bars until my head starts to tingle. Smelling jiffy markers. <laughs> Putting glue on your fingers and chewing it off. <laughs> Listening to music and dancing around my room before I go out to a party and pretending I'm going to have a perfect time. Licking French toast off French, uh, been licking maple syrup off French toast Sunday morning. Finishing an essay, undoing a knot, pizza night, Halloween, watching my baby brother dance naked to Abba, <laughs> blowing on a window and drawing a little picture, being in the choir at the height of the Hallelujah chorus and feeling the voices rattling my bones. <laughs> I started laughing like a crazy person, giddy with endorphins. It was all dancing leprechauns and rainbows and unicorns, streams of chocolate, whirling rides, flashing lights. There's no shame in loving my small town. All the good things that happened to me happened in uranium a horrible accident for me to realize how goddamn wonderful everything is. I used to think that life was just a jawbreaker. Yeah, you suck, and you suck, and you suck, and you suck, and you suck some more. Yeah, you suck some more. At first it seemed so sweet, and the colors come and go, like the seasons come and go. The slush and rain and snow till you can't taste no more. So you suck some more. I used to think that life was just a heartbreaker that just breaks and it breaks and it breaks and it breaks till you can't break no more. Till you can't take no more. It's backwards.
words upside down. There's nothing wrong with being the nicest girl in town. Oh, everything's clear now that I'm here on my sugar cloud. Oh, my soul, it sings a song so sweet and pure. I felt it all along, but now I'm sure. Oh, everything's love, looking down from my So, so tell me a little bit about uh, the preparation to come to New York with the show. First of all, Jacob and Brooke, how do you feel? I mean, given that you started out in Victoria, Canada without many ideas about doing musical theater at all, and here you are coming to New York uh, <laughs> successfully to do musical theater. Super surreal, actually. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I'm in a musical. While yeah, like, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That typical musical where you write, oh, it's New York, right? It's, it's, it's pretty amazing, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. Sort yeah. of 40 Second Street yeah, and fame street. All, all together. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's been, uh, like, yeah, it's been fantastic. I mean, in terms of also, you know, doing it in Chicago was kind of a dream come true, and now it's just, keep, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, every, every, everything has been like a step along the way. We started in that Ukrainian church basement, just fooling around, rehearsing with uh, some local, great, great local talents, and we trying songs, and hey, does this work? And I'm learning how to harmonize as, oh, let's try this harmony, because that one obviously didn't work. Going through that process to get an opportunity to play it locally, and then get an opportunity to play it in Vancouver, the big city across the water for us, and then get an opportunity to try it in Toronto. I mean, each one of those things has been like, wow, this is crazy. And, and again, we've been so fortunate. It's just mm -hmm. uh, knocking wood here, of course, but uh, the things that have sort of happened to, to us and to the show and the connections and people we've had opportunities to work with, bumping it up I every step of the way. So. And have you felt any particular trepidation about bringing it to the town where the real cyclone is? I mean, <laughs> in, in Brooklyn? <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I mean, initially, because, like, there are, like, actually seven or eight cyclones, but maybe some people from... I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've heard touché, that about New York. Touché, yeah. touché. I, I, grew, I grew up in Brooklyn, I'm not yeah. that far from yeah. the cyclone. Yeah, so, so yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, I don't ride it, but yeah, I yeah, live yeah. near it. Um, yeah, so maybe some people will come from Coney Island and go, what? This has nothing to do with Coney Island at all. Yeah, but... Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, there's but a segment of the show that we do shoot on a roller coaster. Uh -huh. We decided very, very much that we could not shoot at Coney Island because <laughs> it would be too identifiable. Yeah, it's a pretty iconic image. Right. Well, you, you should invite Alvy Singer, you know, from Annie Hall, oh, who yeah. lived underneath, <laughs> yeah. the, underneath, who lives the, underneath the cyclone. The yeah. cyclone. Mm -hmm. But but tell tell us a little bit. I mean, each of you about what is going to be different about the New York production and what you're working on during the rehearsal process here. Well, it's so great. I mean, MCC is such a great place to continue the work that we've already started. And mm -hmm. again, it always is about, I think, strengthening the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and we ha have a lot of new generative artists on the project. So the physical production um, will be taking new steps, which I think will, is very exciting. And they're very experimental. So, you know, we're, we're fingers crossed that they, that they come to fruition. But I think it's, it really is about, you know, continuing to strengthen that linear narrative and to make sure that each character's point of view has, has the right arc and that it's abundantly clear. I think it's always been, you know, clarifying um, the kind of rules of engagement for this piece it has, has, because it has so many of them and it's so atypical. So, so Rachel, tell us a little bit about that process of bringing together, I, I assume you mean a different costume designer, a different projection designer perhaps? Well, a I lot mean, of the Chicago designers are coming with us, but we're adding um, some, some new visual artists as mm -hmm. well, some new props artisan and some kind of, uh, some special effects artisans as well. So, you know, we're just kind of um, expanding and, and it was so nice to be able to sit in the room with the people who had some experience and a real deep love for the piece and say, what would you like to do that you haven't gotten a chance to do yet? What do you think would only continue to richen and deepen this piece? You know, and everybody had plenty of ideas about things that, you know, you, you can never do because of time or restrictions. And, and so now we're, we're starting to add those ideas in slowly, but we never want to overwhelm the piece. Mm -hmm. It's a very delicate piece and you want to make sure that you're only doing enough uh, to support it the way that it needs to be and you also want to keep it rough and raw because I think that's really its appeal is that it isn't polished and it isn't shiny it's it's just very very real and one moment you're laughing hysterically and the next moment you're contemplating your own mortality and and crying and feeling very very fulfilled and you don't see it coming well, one of the things that's become clear, I mean, just from watching these numbers, is that each of the singers in the choir has his or her own voice that you've done what you can to mm -hmm. you know, express, and that even though they're a group, a choir, that, that the solos are really yeah. what also uh, yeah. makes the music, not just what they sing together. Yeah, yeah oh, totally, yeah. And I think that that's, in, in specifically, when we were exploring the styles of, um, sometimes it was the character, like, for instance, I, I think we, I'd written Constance's monologue before that song was written. So, uh, so I wrote the monologue and then we were kind of like, okay, what, what is the voice that comes out of there? And also uh, the actress we were using kind of was a very kind of Janis Joplin-y kind of brassy voice kind of thing. And, that, and that's kind of where it's kind of evolved over the course of eight years is, but also, but yeah, the voices are equally as important. The timbre of their voice and the quality of their voice is always very mm -hmm. unique um, with each teenager. Well, one of the things, I, I mean, to talk more about uh, what's going on here in New York, I was quite surprised to hear you say that the, sort of, that the way Canadian theatre works is that they're really well, a, a different kind of rehearsal process, and then really only two performances before you open and critics come. I mm -hmm. mean, so can, can you say something about the, yeah. the pressures of that? And then here, I assume when you went to Chicago, and certainly here, there are months of previews here. So yeah. what, what is the different experience well, like? Well, I, I think in Canada, that has always, it's been a common complaint from a lot of playwrights that the, pr the preview process is not realistic in order sh uh, to show brand new work, because it is such a vulnerable process. And you learn, and the only t and the thing you learn on the first day, the first time you ever put it in front of an audience, is that's your first day of school, so to speak, as to what the piece is, what's, what's landing right. with the piece and what isn't landing with the piece. So it's great that MCC's given us the ability to, to preview it for a, a month and really mm -hmm. try to iron out. It's such that. a luxury, yeah. such mm -hmm. an incredible luxury. Yeah, that, that, that kind of support too. And I mean, just a flashback again, where we came from, the, the levels of support as we'd entered into both Chicago as well as MCC with a, a team of uh, 40, 50 people working on a show for us where there was four of us working on it. And the theater company was the filing cabinet beside Brit Small's bed. I mean, that's, uh, and in terms of just from my own experience of 
writing the music and then scoring the music and then editing the music and then playing the backtracks and doing the things that I got to do. Here we have a team of absolute incredible professionals who are totally taking care of those things which allows us to step back as be creators and composers and reflect on it uh, much more. So that's been one of the most amazing parts of this process for me to see that that's, that's how you do it. That's, so that's how they do it in musical theater. Mm. <laughs> and, and Rachel, how do you as a director pace yourself over the course of the rehearsal process in New York and then through the preview process so that you're still thinking a fresh thing? Well, I mean, this is such a, this piece is, because it's a, com it's a comedy, you, you, we aren't, we're missing our scene partner until we get the audience. So you want to make sure that we don't set too much in the rehearsal room, that we aren't flexible and willing to learn from what they have to tell us. I mean, we're going to, we're going to learn a lot in those first few weeks. And then I think we'll, we will start to um, have enough perspective to look at it and go, okay, these are still where the holes are. These are the things that we need. I, I don't think there could ever be too much time. But I am, <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that we have the amount of time that we do in the rehearsal room and not more. I want to get it together and then get it on its feet and get it in that room. But it is an incredibly complicated physical show for a, such a small show. It has a lot of elements, projection and lights and, and, and you know, band and backtrack and a lot of things. So we, we need the time in tech and we definitely need the time in previews to learn what we need to know from the audience. So we're, we're looking forward to it. Well, we are too. Uh, it will be at MCC beginning in November. And before we get to that, we want to present the final number from the show. So I think, Rachel, you'll set us up. Brooke, you'll go to the piano again. Jacob, you can just, just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is indeed the final song of the play. The shared experience song is tricky to explain without revealing the entire plot, but it was the last song created for Ride the Cyclone and was not in the original Canadian production in this form. It is a shared joyful realization that although their lives were short, they had beauty and meaning. Space. So upward now, so beautiful and strange, but it's more than spinning round. Yes, it's everything you loved, and everything you dreamed, and everything you shared. And everything that seemed so, so terrifying But it's not a game, it's not a game Oh no, no, it's not a game, it's not a game It's just a ride It's just a ride Although sometimes you fall and sometimes you fly You can close your eyes but the light still shines So just take a look It's all so beautiful and strange, but so much more than spinning round. Yes, it's everything you loved, and it's everything you dreamed, and it's everything you shared, and it's everything that seems so, oh, so terrifying. Turn it around. It's just a
us take.